Okay, yeah, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Let's do a mic test. Can someone please confirm whether they can hear me? Just say wa alaikum salam. Okay, you guys can hear me. Good. Alhamdulillah. Okay, it is officially uh, time, so let's go ahead and start. Alhamdulillah wa salatu salam ala rasulullah. Welcome to um, our session, our weekly Quran halaqa session in English. And this week we'll be doing Surah at taqweer But before we kick off Surah at taqweer as always, inshallah, let us start with a review of what we covered last time. So I have a review of the um, of the homework um, and the and some of the stuff that we covered. So I'm just going to go through it very quickly in a couple of minutes. Um, so in Surah Abasa, we said that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has set a very high standard for the believers when. He reminded the Prophet ﷺ of the lack of attention to someone who could not see. Usually a person who cannot see, you would expect them to not notice that you have, uh, let's say, frowned or ha had frustration on your face because they can't see. But blind people can still feel. And sometimes they can feel things uh, that um, their, their sense of uh, hearing uh, becomes stronger. And they're, they're able to still get some idea of how the, the person they're dealing with uh, is reacting. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set a very high standard for the believers by reminding his Prophet of um, Abasa wa Tawalla. And that's something that uh, we have to follow as well. Uh, the second point that we made last week was... Um, so the second point that we made last week was that the for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the fruit of learning is tazkiyah. So tazkiyah is the most important thing. Tazkiyah or the cleansing of the soul, the, the a pure heart is the outcome of knowledge. We gain knowledge so that we would get that outcome. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned both when talking about Abbas wa Tawalla and the coming of Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, because this was a man who was seeking tazkiyah. He, was, he wanted knowledge so that he would get tazkiyah. Allah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala held him in, in high honor because of that. As for the other man that the Prophet was talking to, Walid bin Mughira, that man was not seeking tazkiyah. In fact, he was istagna, he was indifferent to it. It didn't matter to him. And, the, and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded us that when we, when we set out to learn, like what we're doing here, our objective is tazkiyah. Uh, the third point that we made was that the Quran is uh, being described in the surah, in Surah Abasa, as a reminder. It's a reminder to us so that we would purify ourselves. Uh, it's also a reminder of our insignificance because Allah subhanahu wa mentions how we were created. It's a reminder of Allah's blessings because Allah subhanahu wa reminds us of our food and how that food was created. And uh, thirdly, it's a reminder of the day when this creation will end. And uh, finally, it's a reminder of our choice. The choice of what we do every day, the choice of right and wrong, and that decision. And finally, there was a homework. And I asked you guys to listen to the recitation of a different sheikh. I think it was Imam Faisal. Um, I, I hope some of you got the opportunity to do that. Can you just uh, uh, type in the chat window if you got the opportunity to listen to that recitation of Surah Abasa? Those of you who did in the homework. Okay, so some of you did. Okay, that's good. Alhamdulillah. The, what I had mentioned was that I wanted you to be exposed to different recitations. So this week, this coming week, inshallah, I'm going to give you a very, very different recitation, which is Warsh um, an Nafe. How many of you are familiar with the difference between Hafs and Warsh? How many of you have heard of these terms before this? When it comes to the Quran or recitation of the Quran, there are several different uh, modes of recitation. One is called hafs, which is the one that we're familiar with in our region. In fact, uh, in the majority of the Muslim world, that's the one that we hear all the time. That's called hafs. And then there's another one, which most of you would not be familiar with. And that one's called warsh. And there's actually others, but I'm just talking about the other most popular one. That one's used in North Africa. 
Um, anyone who is familiar with the difference, just type it in the chat window. Yes, I know what it is. And um, that will then give me something to, um, to, to point out to you. And if you are not familiar with it, and tell me that too. And, and then, inshallah, um, I will point out uh, some things that you will uh, hear when I give you the homework for today. So I'm assuming that you guys are not familiar with it. Okay, so when I give you the homework for today, it will, okay, so, so some some people are some somewhat familiar with it. Good. Uh, okay, and then other people are not familiar with it. That's fine too. So your homework for today will be, I will give you a recitation of the surah we're going to do today, which is surah taqweer, uh, but it's going to be in wash. And okay, so some people know. That's good. Um, if you know, or you don't know, the challenge will be for you to figure out what is the difference that um, that it, what 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 in the surah is pronounced so differently in warsh from what we normally hear. So I will not talk to you about warsh. There's plenty of information available online, but I want you to pay attention to the surah. So basically, you'll have to listen to the hafs. And you will also have to listen to the uh, the one that I give you, which is in Warsh. And you'd have to tell me the difference. So that's the homework for the coming week, inshallah. And then there's a couple of other things in the homework that I'll, I'll tell you about. Okay, so uh, one of our sisters is mentioning the seven ahruf. Yes, so there's an overlap between the seven ahruf and the recitations. And yes, that plays a role. Okay, let's go on and let's talk about the surah. And once again, as we're going through the surah, pay attention to how I'm pronouncing it. I'm using hafs, which is the normal pronunciation. Uh, but also pay attention when you listen to the surah in Warsh. It's um, once you know the difference, your ears will start picking up on it. And it's a very beautiful transition. That, that's actually a recitation that also comes from the Prophet. ﷺ. And there are many Muslims in the world, especially the ones in the northern half of Africa. If you ever pray behind one of those Imams, they will they will pronounce certain things. And if your ear is used to listening to the Quran, it will sound a little different. And it's beautiful because that difference indicates to you how many people who came to the Prophet and learned what, what were the different modes in which the Quran was transmitted to them. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and talk about Surah at taqweer which is what we're going to discuss today. This is the next Surah. We're still continuing in Juz Amma. Um, the, but there's something special about this surah. It's a short surah. It's a surah about what happens when we come out of our graves on the Day of Judgment. Okay, so there's a set, predetermined sequence of events that we will go through, that all of us will go through, from this life to the time when we'll be, we'll be dead, and then we'll be in our graves, and then we will come out of our graves. So this is a predetermined series of events. This surah is a visual description of what you will see, what I will see when we come out of our graves. We will observe all of this. So pay attention because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us and kind of preparing us. Because when we come out, having read this surah, it will give our heart some thabat. It will give our heart some, uh, I'm try, I, I want to say, it will calm us down a little bit. And on that day, people will not be calm. We will all be nervous, okay? And then there'll be people who will be really, really nervous. So knowing this surah will give us a little bit of calm because we will have thought through this scenario multiple times and we will have gone through this description multiple times. Now, this description itself is haunting. It's horrifying. But it's the reality. It's going to happen. So the sequence of events, very briefly, and a lot of detail can be given, but lack of time. So... The sequence of events is the person is alive. Then towards the end of their days, they um, go through the transition from life to death. They die. And the dead, people bury them. If they have that opportunity, they go into their grave. And then the life of Barzakh starts. While they're in their grave, um, the soul goes to, the, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then depending on how they were in this world, uh, as the soul is being pulled out of the body, um, they might hear very good, kind uh, words to come out of their body, like, ya nafsul inna, or they might hear the opposite. And that is the kind of like an indication of what's going to happen after that. Then the good soul will rise to the heavens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will 
either record the name of that person in the register of the good people or the register of the, the disobeying ones. And then the souls will come down in their body. The souls will stay in the body or next to the body uh, in the grave um, until the day of judgment. And, um, you know, the, the, the way that the, the soul will be treated in the grave will also depend on the kinds of actions they did in this world. Again, I can't go into a lot of detail right now uh, because of lack of time, but I want to get to the point that I wanted to make here, which is on the day of judgment, there will be a loud deafening sound and all souls will come back to life. And by that time, another loud deafening sound has already been pronounced. Allah SWT describes these sounds in the surahs we've already been through as atama and asaha. So asaha is this deafening sound. We, we read about that or we learned about that in Surah Abasa. So that screeching, deafening kind of a sound, it will wake us up, we will come out of our graves. And then this is the scene that we will see. Allah SWT describes that scene. Listen to this scene, observe this scene and imagine that the, this, this scene so that on the day of judgment, when it actually happens, there's some calm in the heart because we were expecting it. Allah says, When the sun is uh, like wrapped up, closed up, like shrunken and closed up like that, put out. We are used to seeing the sky a certain way. We don't even think about the sun. It's just there. Most of us don't come out and say, oh, wow, beautiful sunlight. Once in a while, but usually we don't. But when it's not there anymore, when its light is not there anymore, or when it looks all shrilled up or enclosed up and wrapped up, it will be different. And it's going to be a shocking scene. So expect that the sun will be covered up. And when the stars will uh, like blink out, they will one after another, just like the sun is a star, it will become wrapped up. Other stars will also start wrapping up. And that's being described here as falling down. وَإِذَا الْجِبَالُ سُيِّرَتْ And when the mountains are, the, the translator used the term blown away, uh, the actual Arabic word is سُيِّرَتْ when they are made to move. So compare this with what, what, we, had, what we had read in the first surah in Jul'amma, which is وَالْجِبَالَ أَوْتَادَ And the mountains as pegs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the mountains as pegs. That's in this world today. And compare that with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, which is, well, Jibalu Suyirat, and those same pegs, they'll start moving, which means it's not just the mountains that are moving. Everything's moving. Uh, the mountains were the pegs that kind of held the earth together. Everything in the earth's crust will start changing. This earth will apparently become stretched out and start flattening out. The other thing I want to point out here is that the Arabic that's used here is Wa'idha, which means and when. And then when you say, and when, you might think, oh, we're talking about something that's going to happen in the future. But then the, the last word in each verse is in the past tense, suyirat. It's not yasiru, which is, it, they will start moving. It's suyirat. It's almost like saying, when they will have moved, which means it's so certain. As Allah SWT, as far as Allah SWT is concerned, it's already happened. Human beings are going to find out eventually, but as far as Allah SWT is concerned, it's already happened. So when Jibal Suyirat, Wa and when pregnant camels are left untended. Now, to the modern mind, you wonder, pregnant camels, what does that have to do with me? Well, for the people who were the first addressees, the first people who were being um, uh, addressed in the Quran, for them, the most expensive or the most, the highest value of their investment was a camel that was pregnant and about to deliver. That was the most expensive property that they owned. Because Aisha is like 10, you know, comes from Ashara 10, so like 10 months pregnant, about to deliver. And in this case, Allah SWT is saying is, and when pregnant camels are left untended, like no one's going to care about them anymore uh, because of everything horrifying that's happening around them. And all the wealth that people used to hold here, they're not going to care about that anymore. And when the wild beasts are gathered together, all, all mixed up. Usually wild beasts don't gather to, in, into each other. Um, so I've, I once did a project with wild animals as part of my job. 
And I discovered that they're, you know, the lions kind of like stay together and the elephants kind of stay together and, and they, they don't mix with each other. But on the day of judgment, they will also be going through the same kind of a shock and they will all be pulled together. And there's a very weak narration about human beings on that day being able to communicate with the jinns as well. And the jinns will also be going crazy and running around and they will then go and bring news of the, you know, from the ocean. And then they will say, oh, the ocean's on fire. And then some people who will be close to the ocean will be able to see that the ocean is on fire. But the point here is, Allah SWT says in the Quran, sujirat, And when the seas are set on fire, this word sujira is, uh, sujirat is, it's like a kindling of the fire. It, you know, when something catches fire on its own, you don't have to uh, like gradually heat it up. It just catches fire. So that's what's being described here. How, why, how will that happen physically? Allah SWT knows best. But the challenge that we uh, have is, it's very hard for us to imagine how the world will have changed so much when we live in this world and today we don't see those things, in order to make it easy to imagine, one has to make constant dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with specific terms or specific requests for Allah to take care of us on that day. So the general rule with dua is that when we're making dua for things in this world, it's better to be more generic. Oh Allah, give me good. Oh Allah, give me khair. Oh Allah, give me uh, hasan. You know, give, give me good. Oh Allah, please keep me from, from difficulties. So it's better to make more generic dua. But with the afterlife, when matters of the afterlife come, when we make dua, it's better to be more specific. So be very specific. Okay, oh Allah, in my grave, please have mercy on me. Oh Allah, um, you know, um, uh, on the day of judgment, please give me calmness. Please uh, make me among the people who are wujuhim musfira, dhahikatu mustabshira, people who will have brightness on their face, be happy. Uh, you know, on the on the uh, on the sarat, on the uh, bridge. Um, you know, give me qarar. All of those things. Be specific with the dua of the afterlife, and the more we do it, the more it, it, the easier it will become for us to imagine what that day will look like. Because when we're constantly making dua, that scene becomes a part of how we imagine this world. And the fact that everything is temporary will begin to get settled in our brains. Uh, once Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, he came to the Prophet Sallam, and he saw the, the, some some uh, gray hair. On the Prophet ﷺ. Now, unlike me, the Prophet ﷺ had generally dark hair, and some of his hair had turned gray. And the turning gray of hair among the people of old was seen as a sign of extreme stress. In fact, even in the Quran, it's mentioned that on the Day of Judgment, even a young child's hair will turn gray because of the horrors of that day. So Abu Bakr uh, was very worried about the Prophet. He said, Oh, Prophet of Allah, you have turned gray. And the Prophet said that uh, I have been, I have become gray haired by Surah Hud, Surah Al Waqi'ah, Surah Mursalat, uh, Surah Al Naba, which is, he said, Amma Yadasa Alun, and Surah Taqweer, this surah, the one we're reading right now. And so all of these surahs, what's common between them is descriptions of the Day of Judgment. Oh, this stuff that we're Going through right now, this is what gave the Prophet ﷺ gray hair. So imagine that because he was going through it over and over again, he was reciting it and he was making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he began to appreciate its reality. Um, and then another hadith, this is narrated in Muslim Ahmad, the Prophet ﷺ said, Whoever wishes to look at the day of judgment as if he is seeing it with his own eyes, then let him read if a shamsu kubirat. And uh, uh, meaning this surah. This surah will help us get a picture of what the Day of Judgment will actually look like. So, what, what happens on that day? Okay, so now we have this description. Our eyes are looking at the sky, and then our eyes are looking at the stars, and then our eyes are looking at the mountains. And, you know, the eyes are moving around in, in shock and horror, but what's happening on that day, Allah 
continues and describes and when the souls are paired once more. So the translator in this case, you will notice says the souls and their bodies are paired once more. Before I continue, I want you to start thinking deeply. Tell me, what is mentioned here is when the souls are paired together. What else could this mean? What could be paired together? What, what kind of pairs or what kind of groups are we, could we be talking about? Give me your thoughts. What could be another tafsir? And by the way, ulama have mentioned other tafsir of this verse. Think about it and tell me. Go ahead, give me your ideas. Okay, based on the deeds, sure, that's right. So that's another uh, tafsir. Uh, people who had good deeds, they they will be paired with other people who have good deeds, and and people who don't, um, you know, they'll be paired with other people. As we know, um, uh, when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala describes ashab al yamin, ashab al shamal, and ashab al qun, so those groups are described in other parts of the Quran as well. Yes, that's true. Um, spouses. Okay, yeah, that's uh, one way of looking at it. That's not mentioned by any of the ulama, but sure, you're, you're looking at pairing. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping that with good deeds, inshallah, they'll be paired as well. The spouses will be paired as well. The prophets, ummahs, okay, that's actually a good, uh, uh, that's, a, that's another good way of looking at it, okay? Like when the Prophet ﷺ said, when people will be in ranks in alam al-arwah. Yes, that's right. So yeah, so the ranks uh, are also described in the Quran as well in other surahs. Um, let me see. Uh, and also what we know, those that we loved will be with them in the Akhirah. Oh, good. Okay. So there's a hadith of the Prophet about that. Uh, you will be uh, with those that you love. Yeah, that's right. So the nufus, so ulama have done multiple tafasir. The one or two that I kind of emphasize are the ones that have uh, been um, established. Uh, but uh, as we are learning more, uh, we will discover how other people have, how other ulama have explained this verse as well. It continues, And when the young girl who was buried will be asked, For what sin, for what crime uh, was she put to death? So when the baby girls who were buried alive are asked, for what crime were they put to death? Notice in this case, and you guys know the story that some Arabs used to do that. By the way, one part of the story that you may not know is that there were some Arabs also who used to try to prevent this and they would... Um, so actually, somebody just mentioned uh, souls will join their bodies. Yeah, that's right. So that's actually another uh, explanation that, that that we have for, for the Nufus Uzuwijat that we have in this translation as well. Um, so I, I was mentioning that there were some Arabs who used to prevent those girls from being buried and they would go to the fathers who were about to bury their girls and they, they would say, um, please don't do that. I will take care of the girl. Just give her to me. You would just imagine that you don't have a daughter. And they would then bring up those daughters as their own. There was one man um, and a number is mentioned. Allah knows best whether this number is accurate, but the number of girls that he took care of throughout his life and he had a long life uh, was 800. Um and and obviously there must be, must have been other people who were helping him as well. And also, not all Arabs used to do that. Uh, some some Arabs would keep their daughters. That's how they had women in that society. But the the benefit of knowing this is uh, this verse is that Allah is not going to ask the killer, who in this case is the father. And usually, when someone is killed, it is the father, the mother, you know, these are the people who will go and seek justice. But in this case, if the murderer is the father, then how would this child seek justice? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not even talking to the father. He is not even considering that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is directly talking to the one who was unjustly killed. Anyone who did not have any rights in this world will have all the rights and their rights will be the first ones to be restored on the day of judgment. So anyone in this world who takes other people's rights, yes, sure, we're talking about little girls being murdered, which is like the, the extreme form of brutality,
But even if it's not the extreme form of brutality, if you're taking someone's rights, remember on the day of judgment, if you take anyone's rights in any form, because you have even a, a little bit of power over them, remember on the day of judgment, Allah SWT will restore their rights first. And whoever took those rights will have to answer for that. So may Allah SWT not put any of us in that situation. And if in this world we have even if a little bit of power over someone else, may Allah SWT give us the ability to pull our reins back, fold ourselves back from ever taking anyone else's rights. Ameen. وَإِذَا الصُّحُفُ نُشِرَتْ And when the records of deeds, the scrolls will be laid open. What, this is what you did. All the records, everything will be available. What if the sama kushipot? And when the sky will be like it's like taking the skin off. The sky will be the, the skin of the sky will be removed. In another verse in the Quran, Allah describes the sky as becoming red. Why will it become red? Well, if there's fire on the earth, it will be reflected in the sky as a red sky. What if the jahim su'arat? And when the hellfire will be towered up. In huge flames of hellfire will come out. Now, up until now, whatever has been described about the Day of Judgment is enough to make one's hair stand up on end. It's scary. And even good people, even people who have been pious in this world, even, and may Allah make us among them, they will also feel nervous. However, in this surah, Allah SWT then reminds us that there are many people like that too. So the next verse says, uzlifat," And when paradise is brought near. This word uzlifat or azlafa is like a way of raising the status of the ones who held themselves back, who controlled themselves in this world. Uh, for the sky to turn from blue to red, can it mean from tranquility to horror? Uh, Allah alam, yeah, that's right. So um, when what we are used to is seeing the sky which is blue, but on that day the sky will have become red. Um, and when the jannah is and when the, when paradise will be brought near, and it will be a way of honoring the the believers, because in this world people make fun of us, we are belittled, um, and and may Allah make us among those people who will. Be honored on that day by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. jannah to uzlifat. Notice that I keep making dua because no one's sure until the day they die, right? What they're going to die on. And today we might feel the iman in our heart, but it takes constant effort and a lot of blessing and mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for one to die on this. So we have to keep making dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may make us among them. Alimat nafsum ma ahdarat. On that day, each soul will know what deeds it has brought along. Everything that we did, all of our record we will become aware of it on that day. Aware of it, like fully aware of it. No stuff that we have had forgotten in this world. But on that day, we will know, oh, on that day I did this. And then the next day I did that. And then I did this. And I did this. Everything. Which is, by the way, why many of us will be nervous. Because sometimes we do things and we forget. And then maybe we have iman, good iman afterwards. And we forget that there was a time when we you know, might have done something which wasn't very good. So one has to keep asking for Allah's mercy, for Allah's blessings. Uh, and may Allah forgive us all. I mean, Fala uqsimu bil khunnas. I do swear. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala swears by the receding stars. Al jawaril khunnas, the um, which which travel and hide. Okay, yeah, let's just go with the translation. Which travel and hide. Which like travel in a in a in a particular way and then hide. Walayli uh, idha and the night as it falls. And the day when it breaks. So notice uh, right now we were just now we were talking about the stars. So these stars were very important to the, the people of Quraysh, the people of Arabia. In fact, even to this day, there are people to whom stars are important. So they will talk to you about Burj this and, you know, Capricorn is this. And, you know, that's what's happening over there with uh, with, uh, with, with uh, anyway, I even forget the names of the other ones. But they they'll keep talking about stars. These are superstitious people. And Allah has control over all of this. And Allah SWT is saying, I swear upon all of this. And I swear upon the times at which I make the stars disappear and you can't do anything. You, you can't see stars during the day. So, إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلُ رَسُولٍ كَرِيمٍ With Allah's control and ability, which you have no control over, despite your superstitions, with that swearing, Allah SWT says, this 
is the narration of um, uh, a messenger, a, 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 an honored messenger. I actually do not fully agree with the translation um, I, uh, that the, 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 the person used here. Because when you say qawl, it means narrated from someone. When you say kalam, it is what that person said themselves. So this is the kalam of Allah, but it was the qawl of Jibreel alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's kalam became the qawl of Jibreel alayhi salam who brought it to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Innahu la qawlu rasoolin kareem dhi quwwatin inda dhil arshi makin. Who is this Jibreel alayhi salam? It, it, he is full of power given by Allah, held in honor by the Lord of the throne. Muta'in thamma ameen. Obeyed there in the heaven and trustworthy. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is... Uh, presenting this as the right source of knowledge. And what did these other guys do? They used to say that, oh, I listen to this shaitan and, and, and you know, I have this jinn and I control this jinn and you know, that's how I get this information. Allah SWT is saying this information is not coming from this devil or that devil. This information is coming directly from Allah to his messenger, which was an angel, to the other messenger who is a human and to your ear. This is a very honored source of this information and Allah is swearing upon the, um, the khunnas the Jawar al-Kunnas, the Layl, and the Subh. And saying that this is the source of knowledge. And then Allah SWT validates his messenger. وَمَا صَاحِبُكُمْ بِمَجْنُونَ And your fellow man is not insane. Uh, don't say that he is like all those other soothsayers. وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ بِالْأُفُقِ الْمُبِينَ And he did see the angel on the clear horizon. The Prophet ﷺ saw Jibreel ﷺ. Uh, one day he uh, was uh, very unhappy because the wahi had stopped. Uh, this was in the beginning. Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the wahi to the Prophet in the cave of Hira. And after that, uh, for a while, the wahi stopped. And the Prophet was confused. What, okay, what's happening to me? So one day he was walking and in that state of depression, and Jibreel made himself appear in his actual form, in actual angelic form, which is huge. And he called his name, Ya Muhammad. And he said, you are the messenger of Allah to, to give him that calmness in the heart. So the, the Prophet ﷺ saw him in the clear horizon. And there was no doubt about that. And wherever he would look, he would see Jibreel ﷺ. So this actually happened. وَمَا هُوَ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ بِضَانِينَ And he does not withhold what is revealed to him uh, um, of the unseen. The Prophet ﷺ just narrates. Whatever he's told, he just narrates. وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَيْطَانَ الرَّجِيمِ And this Qur'an is not the word of an outcast devil. And you know, because the, the people being addressed in that case, they know, because they know what the soothsayers say, and they know what this Qur'an is like. And when you hear it, you know that it's completely different. فَأَيْنَ تَذْهَبُونَ So what other path would you take? So what are you guys going to do? In the end, Allah SWT goes back to the same point that was made in the previous surahs. إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا ذِكْرٌ لِلْعَالَمِينَ this is only a reminder for the whole world. To whoever of you who wills to take the straight path. It's a choice. But you cannot even will to do so, except by the will of Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. Meaning, if in your heart you have a flaw, if in your heart you have that, that problem, Allah SWT may not even allow you to make the right choice. So if you want to make the right, cho right choice, it has to come from inside. That humility towards Allah is the beginning of it. And then after that, you make the right choice and Allah then makes the path easy. This is Surat at taqweer If you guys have any questions, go ahead and share them. Uh, I'm sorry, I went over by a couple of minutes. I am going to now uh, share with you the homework. Um, this is the Wash recitation. Uh, so one important homework is, I want you guys next time to tell me what were the what were the words that were different in the Warsh recitation? See if you can find them. They are one or two, uh, at least. So see if you can find them, and you have to listen carefully uh, and compare them with what you're what you normally would uh, hear. Then uh, there are some very good ideas that some of our volunteers gave. So our sisters uh, Fozia and Aqsa they gave us these interesting ideas. So one is this surah is about the record of good deeds, right? On that day, that record of good deeds will be made available to us. Well, how about we practice that? So during this week, how about we make a record of all the deeds, those that fall in good and bad, um, at the end of every day? Just journal. 
no, today I did this and that was a good thing. This is something that will please Allah. And this something, this is something that may not. So how about we get used to that? And that will then help us become more mindful of what we do. So that's a, that's one thing. The, um, uh, the second thing is uh, make a journal of how each ayah in this surah uh, affects you. So just read, recite each ayah and then think about it deeply and say, okay, how does that affect you? So that will help deepen the uh, the impact of the surah. These are some some pieces of uh, uh, some some homework for you. If you have any questions, I will give you another minute or so. Um, and if not, then inshallah we will call it an evening and continue on next Saturday, inshallah. Ayah 26 is powerful and makes us ponder. So, yeah, that's right. So, where are you guys going? Where are you headed? What path are you taking? Allah SWT is addressing us like this. Where are you going? Ask yourself that. It's an important question to ask yourself because on the Day of Judgment, when the sun is closed up, whatever path that we took will eventually lead us somewhere. Uh, which Qari should we listen uh, the surah of? Actually, I have provided a link to the Qari, so to the YouTube video. So if you just follow this, uh, so what uh, uh, our uh, volunteer uh, Isa, I'll ask him, uh, he usually posts the entire homework and, and the YouTube link is in there. So when you listen to this, this is uh, Qari, I forget his name, is it Deen or something like that? Uh, he's reciting in Warsh. So just listen to it and, and that, that is the, the homework that I'm giving you. I hope that answers that question. Any others? All right. Jazakumullah khair. Inshallah, I will see you guys next Saturday. May Allah SWT give you a blessed week and uh, pray for yourselves and pray for Palestine and pray for us as well. Assalamu alaikum.